In his book, Awakened Imagination, Neville says, The world which is described from observation is a manifestation of the mental activity of the observer. So you truly are the unbiased, unaffected, unconditional observer of it all. We've discussed this a number of times recently. I'll link in the description to those videos. You thus exist beyond beliefs and the state of consciousness that you occupy. And you choose what you would like to believe or the state of consciousness you occupy through imagination. To live this way is to live by the pearl of great price, as Neville refers to it, which is to accept that what you feel as real in imagination appears. So by acknowledging that imagination is the true reality from which the world, which is described from observation, is a manifestation of, this allows us to easily accept the self-suggestion. Otherwise, one may unnecessarily look to the visible world for approval and or validation before accepting the suggestion. And by that I mean look to the world that is described from observation, which is the mental activity of the observer resulting in going around in circles. There's no one to change but self. This is living by the pearl of great price. See, there's only one relationship to the mental activity, which is the cause, and the cause is within. Thus, the mental activity can't be accepted as true without your consent. And it is what is accepted as true that is realized. As in, you can observe whatever mental activity without identifying with it if it's not ideal by which it disappears and or reappears ideally as you are already ideal now. And thus as such, it appears as the world which is described from observation, which is a manifestation of the mental activity of the observer. What is specifically thus felt as real in relation to the mental activity. This is for anyone who overthinks or is troubled by mental chatter. And to further clear it up, I'll link to Thursday's video in the description where we discuss how to do it. Thinking clearly and accurately is helpful, and I consider it distinct from overthinking or mental chatter. Mental chatter and overthinking can be released by returning to the position of the unbiased observer, your awareness of being from which the mind is restored to its fluid, dynamic, and clear ideal state, as discussed in a few videos recently. I'll link in the description to them. Also in relation to this quote here from Neville, mental activity may appear in mind, yet it is what you choose to identify with in mind that determines the state you occupy. And if the identification to the belief that allows this mental activity to appear in mind is released, so does the related mental activity disappear in mind as you no longer allow it to appear as activity in mind. So now to emphasize this, acknowledge that imagination is the true reality from which this world expresses from. If you look around, you'll see everything was first imagined from life experiences, invention, or artistic expression, it was all first imagined. I recommend allowing your imaginal activity to be what you consider to be ideal in all areas of your life, and to do so beyond interpretations of appearances in a way that would not be considered ideal. And I also recommend doing this in a way that does not result in mental strain a nice daily momentum, a way of life. So we get to choose and accept the ideal imaginal acts and feeling of them being real beyond appearances as there is only one cause and it is within. The world which is described from observation is the manifestation of the mental activity of 
the observer. And how it appears is done for you automatically. I like what he said here one time regarding appearances. The world moves with motiveless necessity. By this, it's meant that it has no motive of its own, but is under the necessity of manifesting your concept, the arrangement of your mind. And your mind is always arranged in the image of all you believe and consent to as true. So there it is. You get to choose now what you consent to be true, and you don't need any helper to give it to you. It's done for you by grace. So rather than judging by appearances in a not-so-ideal way, we let the world be. This disentangles our mind from the evidence of the senses. For a moment, we let the visible world be by ceasing to label it, and then imagine what implies being ideal now or feeling it as real now without visual cues as well. Whatever is easiest for you, as he says here. To cultivate the faculty of seeing the invisible, we should often deliberately disentangle our minds from the evidence of the senses and focus our attention on an invisible state, mentally feeling it and sensing it until it has all the distinctness of reality. Earnest concentrated thought focused in a particular direction shuts out all other sensations and causes them to disappear. We have but to concentrate on the state desired in order to see it. The habit of withdrawing attention from the region of sensation and concentrating it on the invisible develops our spiritual outlook and enables us to penetrate beyond the world of sense and to see that which is invisible. So by simply letting the world be, which is beyond unnecessary shaming, condemning, labeling, or defining it in a not-so-ideal way. For to define it is to define self, as he says here. You describe another, you describe society, you describe anything, and your description of the thing you observe reveals to one who knows the law the being you really are. So we let the world be beyond appearances, or judging by appearances, and accept what we imagine is reality and remain in that feeling. This is faith, which is loyalty to the unseen reality. Also in relation to this quote here, your description of the thing you observe reveals to one who knows this law the being you really are. This is living by the law, the pearl of great price. Those that live by the law, thus knowing the law, choose to dwell in their ideal state of consciousness and thus don't project what is not considered ideal unto the world which moves with motiveless necessity. Thus, they ideally inherit the earth. As he mentioned in the quote, the world moves with motiveless necessity. By this it is meant that it has no motive of its own, but is under the necessity of manifesting your concept the arrangement of your mind. And your mind is always arranged in the image of all you believe and consent to as true. So the state of consciousness we occupy determines what we do or don't do, say or don't say, etc. All these things happen automatically by law as a reflection of the state of consciousness occupied. It happens automatically by law as Neville says, Not my will, but thine be done. Luke twenty two forty two. O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Matthew twenty six forty two. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Mark fourteen thirty six. This resignation is not one of blind realization that I can of myself do nothing. The Father within me, he doeth the work. So by acknowledging that imagination is the true reality, you can easily choose your ideal state and remain in it. It is your true nature because you are already ideal now in every possible way, from which this world, which is described from observation, appears as a manifestation of the mental activity 
of the observer. Now let's discuss persisting in the state of the wish fulfilled in relation to others, as this is a commonly asked question I receive regarding Neville's information. So simply put, people reflect our state of consciousness. You are aware of the state of consciousness you occupy. There's no need to worry about another state of consciousness, as that imaginal activity could lead to changing your own state of consciousness. Others reflect our state, and there's no one to change but self. Number two, all ideal relationships with others appear automatically from embodying your ideal state of consciousness. By embodying the ideal state of consciousness, you don't try, nor do you need to control another. They appear automatically by law with their own stories of how they got there and relate to you based on the state of consciousness you occupy. Thus again, there's no one to change but self. Others reflect our state. Number three, we don't inharmoniously judge by appearances and thus remain in the ideal state of consciousness, the feeling of it already being so. John 7, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So for example, in my personal life, I remain in my ideal state of consciousness. So if there's mental activity of others, it is ideal in relation to them. When they appear physically in my presence, I automatically imagine them ideal. My gaze remains inward upon the feeling of it being so. Everything else is done for me automatically. The Father within doeth the work. If we fall out of our state, we imagine what implies or return to the feeling of it being true and enter back into it. Now in business life, the same thing. I remain in my ideal state of consciousness. So if there's mental activity towards others, it is ideal in relation to them. When they appear physically in my presence, I automatically imagine them ideally, regardless of what they say or do, as my gaze remains inward upon the feeling of it already being so that they are ideal, from which everything happens automatically and naturally. What we say, don't say, do, or don't do happens automatically as an outpicturing of the state of consciousness. Again, no one to change but self. So now let's encourage this further through a story Neville shared in his book, The Power of Awareness. He said, One day a costume designer described to me her difficulties in working with a prominent theatrical producer. She was convinced that he unjustly criticized and rejected her best work, and often he was deliberately rude and unfair to her. Upon hearing her story, I explained that if she found the other rude and unfair, it was a sure sign that she herself was wanting and that it was not the producer, but herself that was in need of a new attitude. I told her that the power of this law of assumption and its practical application could be discovered only through experience, and that only by assuming that the situation was already what she wanted it to be, could she prove that she could bring about the change desired. Her employer was merely bearing witness, telling her by his behavior what her concept of him was. I suggested that it was quite probable that she was carrying on conversations with him in her mind which were filled with criticism and recriminations. There was no doubt but that she was mentally arguing with the producer, for others only echo that which we whisper to them in secret. I asked her if it was not true that she talked to him mentally, and if so, what those conversations were like. She confessed that every morning, on her way to the theater, she told him, just what she thought of him, in a way she would never have dared address him in person. The intensity and force of her mental arguments with him automatically established his behavior towards her. She began to realize that all of us carry on mental conversations, but unfortunately, on most occasions, these conversations are argumentative, that we only have to observe the passerby on the street to prove this assertion. 
that so many people are mentally engrossed in conversation and few appear to be happy about it. But the very intensity of their feeling must lead them quickly to the unpleasant incident they themselves have mentally created and therefore must now encounter. When she realized what she had been doing, she agreed to change her attitude and to live this law faithfully by assuming that her job was highly satisfactory and her relationship with the producer was a very happy one. To do this, she agreed that before going to sleep at night, on her way to work, and at other intervals during the day, she would imagine that he had congratulated her on her fine designs and that she, in turn, had thanked him for his praise and kindness. To her great delight, she soon discovered for herself that her own attitude was the cause of all that befell her. The behavior of her employer miraculously reversed itself, his attitude echoing as it had always done. That which she had assumed now reflected her changed concept of him. What she did was, by the power of her imagination, her persistent assumption influenced his behavior and determined his attitude towards her. With the passport of desire on the wings of a controlled imagination, she traveled into the future of her own predetermined experience. So now Neville had the opportunity to imagine her ideally based on how she initially appeared to him. And having imagined her ideally, it started to appear automatically, revealed by what he was sharing with her. Then she appeared with a story to echo the ideal mental activity that took place within him. And so this is what I mean by people showing up with their own mental stories to reflect the change that took place within, as there is only one cause, and it is within. So I trust you found this video to be helpful. Let's go ahead and conclude this with an auto-suggestion to further encourage. You could say, I imagine ideally of others and myself as others echo what took place within me. I see myself as all that I desire to be as others reflect what took place within me. I am complete now. I have everything now. I am ideal in every way possible as others appear to reflect what took place within me. Full acceptance of already being all that I desire to be now. If you would like a copy of this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk with you soon. Take care.